we are going to talk about those people who've settled in their faith. And I'll give a few examples. Eh? Maybe you are here and uh, when you are younger, the prayer was, God, give me a tall, dark, and handsome man. One who has money, one who has six-pack, one who has, uh, what else? What else do you ask for? A sec oh, seven figure salary. Hey, to look at seven, to talk at six. I left it at six. <laughs> you know? But years have gone by, and now all you want is a man. You know? Your prayer has changed from all those things. Now your prayer is, God, give me a man. I don't care. I'm not choosy. I just want a man and make him male. Okay? Or maybe when years were younger, you were praying for children and you're like, God, if you give me these children, I will take care of them. I will read them stories on their way to, as they're going to sleep. I will go for walks with them. But this morning as we speak, your prayer is, God, help me not to kill this one. <laughs> you know? You are that, if you've loved, that means you're either there or you've just passed that stage of wanting to kill them, which I do many times. But anyways, but today we want to talk about that, where you've gotten to the point where you've prayed for something until your faith became, it is okay, God. Just come through in whichever way. I don't care. I don't want those big miracles. Me just come through today. I want rent for this month. I want food for today. Tomorrow, tomorrow will come. Me, I just want you to come through today. All right? And we're going to read from the book of Mark chapter 5, if we can go there from verse 21 all the way to the end, which is to verse 43. And I'll read. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake, where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading, fer sorry, pleading fervently with him, my little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, sorry, she had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out of him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, Your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to, Jesus, and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, jo James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave. And he looked, he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Hold her, holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we pray that as we start your word, that Lord, your word will go forth, will transform lives because it is alive and active. I pray that your word will change us, that by the time we live here, we will have found the flame of our faith and that our faith will have been revived to trust even in things that we don't see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And let me, let me give us a brief background to this story. One, 
This story appears in all the Gospels except the book of John. It is found in Mark 5, 21 to 43, as we have read, but it is also found in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18 to 26, and it's found in Luke chapter 8, verse 40 to 56. Um, Jesus had left his, his hometown and crossed the sea to this place called Gerasins. There he found a man who was demon-possessed, and he cast the demons out. But the people were so scared of that act that they, they told him to leave their town. And after he had healed the man, he told him, don't tell anyone. This guy went to the city and told 10 cities what had happened to him. Because for him, it was a big deal. I've lived in this case all my life. And for once, I can, I can live with other people and, and have a normal conversation. So him, he went and told 10 cities. So Jesus left them, and when he had crossed back to the other side, he asked Matthew to be his disciple. So as he's walking, that's when he, he chooses Ma Matthew and says, you join, you're now my disciple, all right? And the crowd that Mark is talking about in verse, chapter 5, verse 21, that was following Jesus was made up of tax collectors who are Matthew's friends. It was made up of uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of law, and sinners. That was the crowd that was following Jesus. Luke tells us, while they were at sea, before this, that Jesus, before they landed to Gerasins, it is when the storm was so bad, and the disciples went and called Jesus and said, please, come, 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 we are dying. And then Jesus said, Jesus actually rebuked them for lack of faith. Because I think according to him, he, he assumed... I don't know if Jesus assumes, but anyways, he assumed that by this time, after all the miracles I've performed while you guys were watching, you should be able to perform this little miracle. You should be able to calm the storm. Okay? So he rebuked their lack of faith. I want you to shelf that part, okay? That he rebuked them for their lack of faith. Remember, today we are talking about faith. And so Jesus woke up, calmed the storm, and life moved on. Jairus, the Bible says that Jairus was a synagogue. He worked in the synagogue, all right? In the, there's actually one along uh, University Way, if you want to visit one. And a synagogue is a place where the Jews worship. And for, for Jesus, Jesus, if we, if we remember in, in, the, um, in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as the rabbi. It was the rabbi's work to teach at the synagogue. And so Jairus' work was like the assistant rabbi. Actually, he was called um, Shama. Yes, Shama. That is the name they used to refer him to. But as a synagogue, as a synagogue leader, his job description entailed uh, activities like reading the Torah to the people, helping other people understand the Torah, what the Torah meant, collecting contributions from people in the synagogue, keeping financial records of the synagogue, distributing gifts from the synagogue to charities, among other duties. So basically, he was the admin at the synagogue. A synagogue leader was like an assistant. And Jesus and rabbis like Jesus were the ones who, were often, who often taught in the synagogue. But the operations of administration was done by the Synagogue assistant, all right? So Jairus was doing God's work. He was serving in the, the synagogue. Like he was holding that position. You know the one you work in church? Like here in Nairobi Chapel? You work here. But doing God's work does not mean you're immune to trouble. It does not mean you're immune to trouble of this world. There are many things in this world which can cause you to be fearful, anxious, discouraged, or even depressed and weaken our faith in God, or make us simply settle for less. For Jairus, we see him telling the Lord when the child was sick. I am sure he could have been anxious the first time he was asked, today you are the one who is going to read the Torah. We are all, we all scared of our first, right? The first time you are on this pulpit, the first time you are doing something, we all, we all have our moments. I am sure he could have been afraid. But I think it was worse when it was his child who was unwell, and he couldn't do anything about it. And you know how children get to us at night? That's when they become more sick. Or even when you have a sick, when you, if you've had a sick relative who has been sick for a while, eh, it can get into you. And so for Jairus, him, he went to Jesus. Jesus was the rabbi he knew. And he had heard about him, so he went to Jesus and said, please come and pray for my child, who is unwell. 
At this, pay, at, at this point, his job description did not matter. The fact that he worked in church did not matter. What he knew is that he wanted his, son, his, his daughter well, and Jesus could do it. And I want us to look at a few perspectives, and we'll start with the Jairus perspective from this story, and what fear can do to our faith, all right? And the first point is that fear and anxiety can hinder or weaken our faith in God when, number one, bad things truly happen, but your fear is overwhelming. You know how there are some times when something bad happens, and then fear follows that completely overwhelms you to even think straight. Jairus' child was sick. Having a sick child or a sick parent or a loved one who has been sick for a long time can be very overwhelming. I remember it was this uh, almost the same period four years ago where Alex and myself received a very depressing phone call from home that Alex's dad was unwell. And uh, it came from my mother-in-law. And um, when she called, things were not good. My father-in-law was completely sick. He couldn't move. His neck couldn't hold his head. His spine wasn't working. He was screaming in a lot of pain. So he was just lying on the bed. So he was rushed to the hospital at Aga Khan um, in Kisumu. And they did some tests quickly, quickly, because he was in a lot of pain. And they found that he had gallbladder stones, bacteria infection, and he was already an, on treatment for prostate cancer and epilepsy. So those four things on one body didn't go very well, all right? And uh, it, was a, it was a difficult, difficult season for us. And what was worse is the treatment. Because he was on a lot of medication, because of all those things they were trying to manage and treat, he developed pan no, Parkinson's, sorry, I was losing the name. He developed Parkinson's. For those on you, of you who know, one of the symptoms for Parkinson's is hallucinations and uh, the extreme, extreme hallucinations. So he was screaming, it was just, it was bad. And uh, for, for most of that period, he couldn't do anything for himself at all. The bill was crazy. I remember there was a time Alex and I were trying to raise 200,000 within a day so that he can, they can continue treating him. Um, even at some point, we had to, to, to get a psychiatrist to just help with the hallucinations, chiropractor to try and manage the back and the neck. Um, and it was, it was hard. But four years later, he has improved, yes, but he's not fully healed. I can tell you it is hard to pray for the same thing for four years. For four years, praying for the same thing that God would fully heal our father. And yesterday, as we speak, he was in hospital for his usual checkups. At least now he can walk, um, he can do a, a bit, eh? but he's not full, fully there. But as I'm saying that bad things can truly happen, but fear is overwhelming. And for us during that, all that season, fear completely drowned us. And then number two, you have some, some old baggage. I couldn't help but think, maybe the woman with the issue of blood, maybe the woman with the issue of blood actually met Jairus at the synagogue. And maybe Jairus prayed for her that God would heal her. And it did not happen. And I'm sure there are many prayers that Jairus might have prayed for many people in that temple. And the prayers were not answered. And even once when it was his daughter, when he prayed and the daughter was still sick, and actually even to the extreme that the child died. And I'm sure anxiety might have choked that which he had hoped, that since I serve God, that God will come through for me. And like many of us, you may feel overtaxed by it, and your faith in God may be weakened. Bad things do happen, yes, but being overwhelmed by fear, fear, fear of them happening is not good either. But it could be something that happened in your past and certain events trigger the memory. Maybe when you, there is a certain perfume, when you hear it anywhere, it reminds you of a really bad thing that happened in the past. Maybe there is some baggage that you've not dealt with. For example, people who are abused as children often relieve the trauma when a present situation activates the feelings from the past. Such a person's faith in God can be weakened whenever these triggers are experienced. Or number three, 
Maybe you have a sense of powerlessness. Jairus was not a pharmacist or a medic. He was neither a prophet nor a faith healer. He was powerless to make his daughter well. We are not created to be omnipotent or to have power over other people, circumstances and life. In fact, people who want to control everything, we refer to them as control freaks or micromanagers, right? Yes, because you want to be in charge of everything. Thing, everything has to go your way. They are forever, these people are forever upset and uh, because of their inability to get, every, to get everything to go their way. But on the other hand, there are those who let circumstances and people control them. They feel like they have very little choice and allow others to make choices for them. Or like Jairus, you lack certain abilities and so you do not know what to do. Fear as a result of a sense of powerlessness can weaken your faith in God. Another example that I have, and I shared this with the staff team, and maybe I've even shared here, of one point in my life where I felt completely powerless. You can't change the situation. You have no say. was in 2007-2008. Um, I was staying in a, in a mission station where I was working, and my mom was staying five minutes away from there. And my mother calls me and says, don't come home. It is not safe. I used to go home whenever I want, just walk out and go home. But on this occasion, my mom says, don't do what? Don't come home. And uh, we got a few threats from where I was working, and they said, you have until four to vacate the premises. So we're like, okay, fine. Me, I told me I picked, I, because I was going nowhere for Christmas, I had given out my bag for someone to go for holiday with. So I picked a yellow, you remember those yellow big paper bag? And packed my things there. You only pick what was important. I think I worked out with like two, two sets of clothes or something. And I put them there with my documents, which was more important. And my uncle had called and said, so I'm coming to pick you guys. So he was going to start with the family that was the farthest from where I was, coming towards where I was. I was the last one to be picked. So because I know my mother, I decided, let me just go home and tell my mother to pack we are leaving. So I walked out with a friend of mine, and I told my mom, so we are going. She's like, start to end up. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Life is more important than these things you're trying to protect. Let's just go. So she's like, okay, fine. Let me pack I need the documents, and we can go. But me, I needed to go and pack on the other side. So we left home with the, uh, that friend of mine, and just beside the road, there were a group of guys that I could tell you their names, because we schooled together. And when they saw us, they were holding the machete, or the pangas, we call it, and they did this on the road. It was the longest walk to the mission station. The longest walk. And I think what hurt me the most is that I knew these guys. I knew them by names. You know? And so I get to the mission station, pack my things quickly. My uncle calls and says, so, uh, we are here. So you can, you can come. I get into the car. And guess who is missing? My mother. She did not board. I asked them, so where is she? They're like, uh, she was left. I called her and I asked her, Yanni, see, I thought we talked. She was like, you just go, me, I'll be fine. So I went, one, we didn't even know where this car was going. As long as it's moving, see, we're going. Let's go, wherever you're going, let's just keep going. Because everywhere it was burning. But I remember I felt completely powerless. Completely. Everything was out of my control. I couldn't control my mother. And then I, I went to Nakuru, and things were bad. We were just moving from one place to the other. But I remember one of my uncles said, hey, me, my sister is stressing me up. So me, I'm going to check on her. He traveled. The day he traveled, the route he was using was, is what the news covered. That is how many cars were burnt there. And then his phone was off for three days. Come he forgot his charger. Him, he went. He's having too much fun. He forgot everyone. And then he comes back and says, let me tell you, your mother is safer than you. Because my workplace realized that my mother, everybody moved in the entire village and she was left alone, they sent her two cops to protect her. So she was safer than the rest of us. <laughs> but anyways, um, but yes, for me, that, that was a difficult, difficult moment. Especially not being able to reach her and reach my uncle, and she's not, she didn't come, okay? And fear and anxiety or discouragement can weaken our faith in God. In go, sorry, fear, anxiety, or discouragement can weaken our faith in God when, number one, you feel alone in the universe without God. 
Are there times you felt like God has left you? I have, many times. And the woman who experienced the issue of blood was 12 years. What takes a woman maximum seven days, right? Maximum seven. This woman went through it for 12 considered unclean. I want you to imagine with me, it's December. It's Christmas. Like for real, it's Christmas. And then for her, she can't come where people are because she's considered unclean. And I, and I also want you to imagine you're going shopping to Kware. And you have to go around announcing, I am unclean, I am unclean, I am unclean, all the way and all the way back to your house. Because that is what she was required to do. She must have felt very alone and cut off from people. And sometimes, uh, according to Gary Chapman, I don't know how many have read the five love language, and one of them is touch, you know. But this woman, no one could touch her because they are considered unclean. God has made us so that we actually take other people into our hearts. When we know that others love us and we feel deeply connected with them, we feel secure even in our faith in God. This woman for 12 years was cut off from this kind of fellowship. She experienced a lack of acceptance because of her, of her blood issue. If we have known a lot of acceptance and have had our imperfections loved, forgiven, and accepted by God and others, then we do not fear failure. Imperfection or other bad things about ourselves. Forgiveness and acceptance makes it possible for us to live within our own skin and be unafraid of being found. The woman was very afraid when Jesus asked, who is that who has touched me? She was very afraid. Because she was not used to that. She was not used to people recognizing or calling her out. And maybe she, she thought, wow, now I thought this was going to be just a secret. I was just going to touch and go home and go, go home with my healing. But now this man even knows that, that I'm healed from just touching his cloak. Feeling cut off from people can weaken your faith in God. And number three, you have critical voices in your head. How many have those? How many have conversations within their head and themselves? You're like five in your head discussing something. Thank you. The kids connect. Um, the Bible says this. The Bible says that this woman said to herself in verse 28, it was a conversation she had in her head. Some people go through life with an internal critique, a voice inside their head that is always telling them fearful, negative, or critical things. That makes them afraid. And these voices, if you've had one of these ones in your head, eh, it is okay to nod. You will never be forgiven. See, you're a loser. No one is going to, no one is, no one is going to like you if you mess this up. If that deal doesn't go through, your career is over, and you will never get another job. That is the worst thing you could have ever done. You're such a hypocrite. If this happens, it will be terrible. Kita umana kabisa. Or if this one rejects you, it proves you are going to be single for a very long time. Okay? You know, we have those negative ninis in our heads. Eh? Such internal critical voices can weaken your faith in God. They can paralyze you to never doing what you fear or make, or make you avoid it. But when we act by avoiding doing what we fear, then we are actually feeding our fears and not our faith. The quote actually, uh, we, we mostly tend to say that the opposite of fear is faith. Let me uh, give you a different one. That fear is believing, is having faith in the wrong thing. Because you've believed the lie. Not faith. Faith is in taking the first step. The one that you need to take. But fear, but, but, no, sorry, but, but that the opposite of faith is actually believing in the wrong thing. If we let our fears and feelings of aloneness and sense of powerlessness and anxiety and negative critical voices in our head and old baggage get, get to us, then we live a very discouraged Christian life or even become depressed. Let me say something about depression just a little bit, eh? Have you ever heard someone say, I feel so depressed because I didn't get a raise this year? Or some will say in January, I gained two more kgs. I'm so depressed. Or something like, Rongai people, he vumbi a Rongai is making me depressed. People who are depressed rarely use the word depressed. Rarely. What you're trying to say is just a feeling not really depression. 
most of us have made these kinds of comments to describe a negative experience or a bad day or an event. Though we are describing events and feelings that can be deeply sad and discouraging, we are not describing depression. Those who truly understand depression use the term somewhat sparingly. Depression is one of the most painful experiences a person can go through. From the story, I can imagine the woman was depressed. You are alone, you have no friends, your family can't come near you because you are not clean. She must have been depressed because of the isolation. Perhaps your faith in God this year has been challenged, as you have experienced events this year which have left you feeling utterly alone and utterly isolated, inside and outside of yourself. You thought they were your friends, who you do life together with, but they left you feeling utterly alone and isolated for a period of time when you really needed them. Jairus must have asked himself this question too when the mourners started laughing. I don't know if you noticed that part. When Jesus said, what are you mourning about? The child is just sleeping. What did they do? They laughed. These are your friends who are supposed to have come mourning. And from I can this Lunjes, I'm married to one. So these are my relatives. Eh? And you know how Lunjes move in? Okay, um, yes. Or even Kikuis actually we do. Yes. Or here in, in our culture where during the morning season, people move into your space. They are all over, they are cooking in your kitchen, they are showering there, they have moved, they are not cooking the house anymore because there is food on this other side, you know. And then imagine someone comes and they brought help and then those people are now laughing. It must have been really hurtful for Jairus. You'd think they were genuinely grieving with him, but they were not. Instead of them joining their faith with Jairus' faith for this child to be raised, then they laughed. In fact, they wanted Jairus not to bother the teacher. You remember they told him, your child is dead, don't bother the teacher. You remember? Yes. Jairus perhaps had left his home knowing his wife and children were in good hands. But when he came back, the experience he found, he realized they were not. Or maybe this is the year you felt a deep hatred, self-hatred that constantly attacked your soul with condemnation and criticism. You have never been one who had self-esteem issues, but this year you've struggled with what was said about you and how it was said. And you have a constant self-image because of what happened during the year. The woman with the issue of blood must have felt the same way. Or maybe this year you felt non-existent, not really alive and real. Your work which used to give you joys left you feeling numb. You felt like you have been detached from life. Maybe a phrase which captures this season of your life is trying to swim in mud or trapped in a deep hole. You felt lethargic. You've tried to motivate yourself but to no avail. If you have felt this way for an extended period of this time, of this year, then you understand depression. People, non-Christians and Christians, respond differently to those who, who, who are going through depression. Actually, the first thing we say is, hey, I hope I don't get myself there. Or, I hope I'm never depressed when you see them. Then what makes depression different from discouragement? So that you know the difference, right? Depression has a life of its own, so to speak. It occurs independent of the circumstance. For instance, those, let's say you are having major issues at your workplace and uh, you're planning to go to Mombasa for the holidays or go to Shags. When you go to Shags, if, you, it, if it was just discouragement through the year, you will relax, come back, and you're super excited in January to go back to the same work. But if you are depressed, it is just a depressed person in a relaxed environment. Nothing has changed. When you're feeling down, your feelings can be often cured by changing the environment, but for depression, environment doesn't work either. True de depression doesn't go away so easily. When you're depressed, even change of environment can't remove the symptoms. You can tell a, a, a depressed person, I care about what happens to you. In their depressed mind, this is how they edit what you have said. That's because you don't know me. Or, I hear you, but I don't feel you. A discouraged person will be very encouraged that you say that. Very encouraged, they're actually happy, at least you care for them, it touches their heart. Many people in church do not understand this about depression, so they try to help the depressed person by talking about the love of God, the provision, all these things that are good about God, and then they wonder, how come you're not getting it? 
Why are you not getting what I'm saying? Yet I'm telling you that God is love, God is caring and everything. But if you have some people, there are some people that you will meet and you can already tell they are depressed. Have you ever met such people? There is some darkness that walks around them. Eh? You meet them and you already know. Oh, you, something is off. But are those you will not tell. They are sitting here. Maybe you are sitting next to one. They are smiling, they are happy, they are having a good Sunday. So you think. But they are genuinely depressed inside. I remember when I was in Form 3. Um, I didn't know it was depression then. Now when I look back is when I know that it was depression. And I was going through a very rough time. But I couldn't point a finger to what was really going on in my life. And uh, it was a major low. The lowest I have been in my life. And I would wake up and say, I'm not going to school. And I wouldn't go. At least the person who I was with was very understanding. I would say, it's okay. If you don't feel like going, then don't go. He was understanding at the, the, the space where I was at. Eh? And I remember there were days he would ask me, so what are you going to do? I'm like, we had an a a store upstairs. I'm like, me, I just want to go upstairs and stay there the whole day. He's like, I'll send someone who wants to pick something in the store. That's it. No one else will come. And I'll go up there and journal and cry the whole day till 6 p.m. Then I show up at 6. And I remember he asked me a question. He compared me with another lady. And he said, Jane, you have school fees. You can go to school. You have a parent. You have us. Like, you have everything that anyone your age would want. Then there was another girl who had been kicked out from a children's home. And both of us had ulcers. Now mine was even severe than hers. And I remember he asked me, so between the two of you, who should be stressed? <laughs> I'm like, I know it's her. But then I had no control of what was going on in my life. And I remember he asked me a question. What is the worst thing that you could do? And I told him maybe run away, my childish mind. But I didn't tell him the truth. I was suicidal. But I didn't want to tell him that. So I told him, I can run, maybe run away. And he told me, if you want to run away, come, I'll give you transport. Tell me, just tell me where you're going. I'll give you fare, you go. I promise you it happens several years. I just go and I'm like, today me, I'm not going to school. I'm going to ABC. He's like, okay, how much is it here? Go. When are you coming back? When you decide to come back, you come back. And I think that really helped me come out of it. it took me almost a year. But I came out of it. And I think what really, really encourages me in scripture is that nothing is new. Jesus himself was no stranger to depression. He understands it. His nature that we, re we read last week with Pastor Chesa in Isaiah chapter 9 is that the darker the despair, the more his life, his, sorry, the more his love and light will grow. The darker the despair, the more his love and light grow. Paul identified with depression also in his own suffering in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 6. Jesus described his experience in the Garden of Gethsemane in similar terms in Matthew 26 verse 38. If these are some of the things which challenged your faith this year, leading to you settling or expecting less from God, what should we then do? How then should we live? Now that we've identified, maybe you've experienced now, what is the way forward? And, a, and an encouraging story of faith and how we should live is the story of Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 12, God promised Abraham he would give him, he would make him the father of many nations. So Abraham and Sarah began expecting that they were going to have a child, all right? See, God has spoken. So what other way? See, we're going to get pregnant, we get a child, right? I can imagine that maybe they started shopping, deciding how they were going to adjust their tent, where the crib will be put. If it was in today's days, maybe it would have been the Instagram reveal. Yes, when you want to join of it too. Instagram reveal of how you're going to tell people you are pregnant, the photo shoot, all those things. Month one came and went. Month two came and went. Month three. Month four, we are still going. There is no baby, no pregnancy. We are trying. Nothing is happening. It went on like this until when you are reading in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham had settled in his faith that he, all he wanted from God was one son. Mumoja tu, wakufunika ibu. Just one. Just give me a son. I don't care about the nations. I don't care. We just want one son. And you can even see that it caused a domain in their house between him and Sarah. 
By the time God is speaking to Abraham in chapter 15, according to their age, it was about 10 years. They have waited for 10 years for this child who is not coming. So it is at least 120 months of no baby while trying to have one. 120 failed attempts. 300, no, yes, 3,650 3, unanswered prayers, assuming he prayed every day for this one thing. 520, badung tato, assuming one person asked them every week if they were expecting. So we all know that. When you get married, the first question people start, start asking you the second month is, when is the baby coming? So we know, so we know our behavior, we Kenyans. You know? And in Genesis chapter 15, after Abraham is, after Abraham is settling, God calls him to his promise. We know it was a night because God tells him to go outside, look up and look at the stars, and uh, take your eyes off the one... Nini, no, so he, he asked him to go out and look at the stars, and he says, you will, all those stars that you can see, those will be your children. You will be the father of nations. My promise, Bado Haijanini, I will still fulfill. And sometimes we focus so much on the one seed that you have. I had some seeds. I think I lost them. Anyways, I was carrying one ka seed for Nini Orange. Eh? And it is small and maybe you can't see it. And when the Bible talks about the mustard seed, that even the faith as little as a mustard seed is enough to move a mountain. A mustard seed, I had one, I don't know how I lost it. Um, but it is almost like two dots. You know when you're writing and you put a dot? Two of them, that's the size of a, of a mustard seed. Now imagine God is saying, all he's calling you to is that cafe. You remember he rebuked his disciples for their lack of faith? So we are not going to be rebuked, right? I hope we've been rebuked now, we are hoping to grow our faith. Eh? Even that ka small, ka small drop like that. And so, even for that seed, when you put it on the ground, no matter how much I pray overnight for God to bring fruits tomorrow morning, nothing will happen. Because there's a process to it. I have to plant that seed. I have to take care of that seed. And there are days when the sun is extremely hot. And there are days when it will thoroughly rain. But my work is to protect the seed. That is my work. And that is what God is asking us to do. What is your step of faith that you need to take this morning? What is that step that you need to launch out to go and do despite the fear? What God wants is idiot Christians who just do things and have no idea what is going to turn out, but they trust in a big God. You've just come out, you don't care, but you're like, I know the God that I serve. He has said, I resign my job, I am resigning my job. He has said, I start my business, I am starting that business. You launch out despite the fear. But I have to put my seed in the ground. That is the work we need to do. And you say that is our first step. But then, what if the circumstances of your life try to weaken your faith? Choose to believe in scriptures. The Bible says that the word of God is alive and active. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Cuts between the bones and the man, you know. And it is alive. So sometimes the there's, there's circumstances around, around you, whatever is going on in your life can be so overwhelming that you have no faith within yourself. That you will find our anchor in the word of God. What do you do when you, real, when you, when you feel anxious? Put your faith in God's word, which tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request known to God. But what do you do when you feel discouraged? That in Psalms 43, verse 5, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Jesus told Jairus to not be afraid about the bad reports, but to have faith. He told him not to be afraid of the, of the bad report, but to have faith. I'm not sure what Jairus was thinking. You've come to the teacher, you've told him your, son is an, your daughter is unwell, you're on your way there, then he's stopping to ask who has touched his clock. Your child is dying. And then someone comes and says, okay, your child has died. And then he's telling you, don't, don't be afraid. Have faith. 
And today maybe that is what God is telling you this morning. That don't be afraid. Have faith. I don't know what report you have received. But maybe what God is saying, have faith. Don't be afraid. What do I do when I have no peace? Put your faith in God's word that says, John 14, 27, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Then what do I do when all hell is breaking loose in my life? Remember the truth of Psalms 23, verse 4, that even though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that I will fear no evil. What do I do when the critical voices in my head tell me I am not good enough? Remember the truth that is in God's word. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Verse 39. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. This message is for someone who has settled in their faith. If you used to believe in God for big things, but now you don't. Life has kept on happening to you, and now you have stopped believing in God for big things. So you only make those miserable prayers, or the usual ones, consolation price prayers. Let your story of faith be told in December 9th, 2080, when none of us is here, that if they were to rewrite Hebrews, that they would say, it was by faith that myself, put your name there, it was by faith that Jane gave a significant service to God's work while at NCR his church. Even though Jane is long dead, he still speaks to us today by this example of faith. Let it be said it was by faith that NCR members signed up and went to do God's work in Kware, New Zealand, Vietnam, Zambia, Italy, Meru, Narok, Namibia, Crossroads, and across the world. This work was pleasing to God. NCR members understood it is impossible to please God without faith. All knew those who want to come to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those his, who sincerely seek him. Let it be said it was by faith that Sharon quit her job. You can put your name there. Her well-paying job to save her marriage and family. She obeyed God who had warned her about how her children will turn out if she continued being an absent parent at home. Let it be said it was by faith that Pastor Tony obeyed when God called him to leave Rongai, to live in a foreign country. He went not knowing anyone there, but he lived by faith there. His children did the same. You can replace your name with Pastor Tony as well. That Pastor Tony wanted his future to be designed and built by God. Let it be said it was by faith that Cheruto was able to adopt and care for children. Although she had little resources, she, she trusted God was able to provide for her. Let it be said you did not settle in your faith. If the Bible was to be rewritten in 2080, that the writers would put your name and say, so and so suffered, Opio suffered, whoever is here, Maggie suffered, Leroy suffered. Just put your name. That it is impossible to please God without faith. As you get into 2019, as you look back into 2018, don't let fear or anxiety or discouragement or depression hold you back from trusting in God. In the Bible, there are 365 do not fear verses. Actually, more than that. I can't read all of them, but let me read just a few. That Psalms 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? I remember when I was in Form 3, these are some of the verses that were printed out to me. All of them, a good number. And when things were really thick, thick and I was feeling very down and very depressed, these are the verses I would read out loud to myself. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. What are you afraid of this morning? What are those things that scare you? Just the thought of it scare you. What lies about God have you believed in? Have you believed that God doesn't love you? That God doesn't care? That he is mean? 
that he's too strict. He's not understanding. He's absent. He walked out just like your father did or just like your husband did. What lies have you believed about God? And I'm going to give us a minute to just reflect on our lives and ask yourself, what are those lies that you have believed in about God? And then we'll pray about what are those things that you are fearful about? What are those things that are giving you sleepless nights? And what are your fears? Is it fear of Saturn? Fear of divorce? Fear of death? Fear of death of a loved one? Fear of failure? Fear of the future? You don't know what tomorrow holds. Fear of having committed the unpardon un unpardonable sin? Fear of specific people? Or animals? Or objects? Fear of being able to love others? Fear of marriage? Fear of rejection by people? Fear of never getting married? Fear of never having children. Fear of confrontation. Fear of being victimized by crime. Fear of never being loved. Fear of never being loved by God. Fear of divorce. Fear of becoming or being a homosexual. Fear of financial problems. What are your fears? What are your fears? Let's take some time to just renounce those things in your life. That you'll ask God to deliver you. And that the, and that the Lord will enable you to know that God is intimate and involved. That He is kind and compassionate that is accepting and filled with joy and love, warm and affectionate, that is always with you and eager to be with you, that is patient and slow to anger, that God is loving, gentle, protective of you, that God is trustworthy and wants to give you a full life. His will is good, perfect, and acceptable to you, that God is full of grace and mercy, and he gives you freedom to faith. That God is tender-hearted and forgiving. His heart and arms are always open to you. That God is committed to your growing and proud of you as his growing child. Let us pray. And if you are in, maybe you'd like us to pray with you, you can please stand to your feet. If you believe the lies that maybe we have read, or many other that maybe we've not even read. Or if maybe you're battling with fear. Fear of stepping out, fear of launching out fear of doing something that you know God has told you to do, but you're not sure of the outcome. Please stand and we'll pray with you. <laughs>